Welcome everybody to our recap of Member Summit 2024. It feels like it was months ago, not two weeks ago. Uh, maybe the fact I spent a week in the Caribbean between Member Summit and now has something to do with that. So that might that might have something. It might be. It might have something to do with it. And that Delta lost half my luggage at the end of the trip and all kinds of fun stuff. So it seems like it's been a little bit longer, but going back and putting some slides together and looking at some of the photos we got the photos from the professional photographer thinking about all the discussions even going through the photos I'm like oh that was a great discussion oh i remember that taking place it was really fun going back and reliving a bit of the member summit so we'll try and recreate some of that here for those that were at the member summit and give a little bit of an overview on what took place for those that were not able to attend member summit uh, my name is Matt Seaman with the Consortium for Service Innovation. Uh, we are a not-for-profit alliance of companies, mostly the companies that showed up at the member summit to come and explore some topics with, with us. And we really are about looking at ways to improve engagement, employee engagement, customer engagement, whether it's digital, in-person, and that was very much reflected at the member summit as we explored topics around AI and empathy and culture and coaching and how these things are intersect intersecting the impacts it's gonna have on us as professionals and people, uh, just really very exploratory topics, but also things that we can walk away with and go explore and test and iterate on to try and turn into operational models as the consortium does and all the members do. We started Member Summit with a total solar eclipse. I was really happy that we were able to get that scheduled for the start of Member Summit. These were some photos that Andy took. He took amazing photos of the uh, the total solar eclipse, and I'm very excited that I got to experience it in person. It was quite a way to kick off thinking about all of these things going on and all the changes we're going through, the excitement of something like a solar eclipse that very few people in their lifetime get to experience in person, but also knowing that a solar eclipse has been happening forever. It's not like it's a new thing to happen, um, but still always brings up a lot of things and creativity and sparks imagination, similar to a lot of the topics that we talk about, where they're iterations on things we have been exploring for years, but we're always finding new things in it. We're always seeing something different. And Member Summit was a great place to come together and explore those topics, especially in this age where we are at the cusp of massive change, massive disruption due to AI, but we have the tools to navigate that as an organization and a group of people. We, we kicked off talking a little bit about shared experience and the fact that our shared experiences spark innovation and spark testing and spark ideas. And boy, did we get to have an experience that at the summit. So one of the things which I loved about looking back through some of the photos and being at the summit is every time you look around the room, there are people deep in discussion, people sharing notes, but everybody was smiling. Everybody was always laughing. What a great group of people that we got to spend some time with in Fort Worth. Open space board filled up. We actually added a grid on the end of it. So in real time, Kelly added some added extra space since there were so many topics for, for, for the uh, open space sessions. But what a great time everybody seemed to have and sharing experiences and getting to learn from, from each other. At Member Summit, we had 105 professional people show up, 35 new people that had never been to a Member Summit before, and seven new member companies from the last Member Summit, and 50 different companies in total uh, were represented. So just a diverse group of people that came together to share their ideas and share their experiences. We had some, I'd say, more traditionally type presentations uh, and sessions. So 17 different people presented from 13 member companies and one professor, uh, really on a range of topics. Machine automation, AI definitely was a dominant theme across member summit. Um, but we heard a lot about people's KCS journeys and intelligence swarming, 
definitely the intersection of machine automation, people, and culture were a big part of all of the different sessions as well. With open space, 30 different topics were explored. AI use cases, AI impacts, maturity of AI, where it actually exists, what we have to think about as humans definitely dominated the topics. They weren't the only topics, but definitely were, were dominant, which made sense since that is one of the big things that all of us are discussing and facing. And again, just countless discussions took place, countless connections were made, meeting some new friends, getting to catch up with old friends, um, hearing new stories, meeting people from around the world, just, just a great time and all of the different connections that were made. And I'm hoping that the people were able to attend, keep those connections going and leverage the Slack workspace, leverage each other to kind of continue to build on those relationships. And remember that there's this amazing community that's been built to help support each other through our journeys with all the different things that you're working on and thinking about. The theme of Member Summit was exploring the intersection of artificial intelligence, empathy, and knowledge. When we look at the agenda and the different topics that were discussed, it was a theme that we pulled throughout the event, starting with some context setting on our adapting world with AI, hearing a little bit about what people are actually doing with Gen AI, and then how we're gonna support humans and practical applications of tending to your teams, tending to remote teams. Then we had some breakout sessions uh, that continued to explore what, it, what a KCS journey looks like, uh, innovation in a world full of constraints. We all live in a world of constraints. While we love to think about everything in, with the principle of abundance, we know that not everything is in a principle of abundance. Money, time, resources, those are not things that live in a world of abundance. And those are the things that we have to think through as we are doing, um, doing more and trying to innovate. Uh, some intelligence swarming, which seems to spark a lot of discussion as well uh, around where we can take intelligence swarming, where is the state of intelligence swarming. So I'm excited to continue that thread throughout the next year. And when conversations go off the rails, not that ever conversations go off the rails, but uh, sounded like a fun, fun session that Kelly will talk a little bit about in a few minutes. We did get to have Nick Bontrager, uh, who is an associate professor of new media and art at Texas Christian University, come and talk to us about the intersection of um, kind of art, empathy, and artificiality. He took us through a journey thinking about, you know, what is technology? And, you know, today we think about technology as one thing. 200 years ago, people thought about technology as something very different. And what we think of as very simple things today at one time were crazy innovations, crazy new technologies. And he kind of took us on the journey through thinking about our how art and artificiality and technology intersect and talked about his latest art installment called Oracle, which is a... AI powered interactive art exhibit of a burning tire that you can ask questions to about the environment and climate change. And it was fascinating listening to him kind of intersect all these things together. So it really was a um, fascinating talk by him. And he was a, a great speaker, very engaging, very, very much a, what I would expect an art professor to be like. And he was a, a great person to have come talk to us and make some of those connections with our <clears throat> leading up to our dinner at the Modern Art Museum. So it was a nice lead into our, our dinner at the Modern Art Museum. On day two and day three, uh, day two was open space, which is always a fan favorite and continued to be a fan favorite. Uh, and then on day three, we had kind of four short presentations, discussions um, by a host of people on different topics that all relate to things that we're working on or will continue to work on as we go through 2024 and into 2025. 
So that was kind of the rough agenda of how we organized the event. Uh, and intermixed with that were some receptions, great food, dinner at the art museum, and lots of time for people to make connections and have all those hallway conversations, which are often where the most innovative discussions take place. We did get to experience the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Uh, I do want to thank our dinner sponsors. They're the ones that made it possible for us to host a dinner in a unique venue. Um, we had an hour to explore the exhibits and go through the art museum before having our dinner. And as always, it was just an amazing experience to go around the room and talk to all the attendees that were there. The food was fantastic. The food was really, really good. I think everybody enjoyed, enjoyed the food. Um, but again, just a nice way for people to connect over a nice dinner in a unique setting and think about how art and empathy and artificial intelligence and all the things that are impacting us every day in this world are um, you know, going to shape the things that we're working on and how we're going to interact as humans. And it was fantastic to get together and share a glass of wine and some good food and interact in a unique space at the Modern Art Museum. So we talked about um, looking before you leap. If you see some of the photos and talk to people that attended, you'll notice that there are little orange frog pins that people had on their badges. This is the pumpkin toadlet, which often leaps and jumps before it knows where it's going to land or even knows how to land. And kind of a theme that has developed around thinking about our world and AI and the impacts of AI is that right now, sometimes it feels like we are jumping into something without knowing where we're landing or even why we're doing it. So thinking about our adapting world really being driven today by artificial intelligence is a big theme that we are working on and hearing about across the membership. So our economies have gone through major shifts and changes from very agrarian, farmer-based to the industrial revolution. This was powered by innovation and powered by automation, and powered by change with the steam engines, sewing machines, and these technologies that shifted us from farmers to factory workers. Then as more automation took place, as factories became automated, we shifted into a analytic or a thinking economy where services in office work is the, the main driver and it is today still the main driver of our, our economy. But there are a lot of indications um, that we are now starting to shift into the next economy, which is a feeling economy or an empathy-based economy where it really is going to be about human interaction and things like healthcare and services are going to be the dominant economic driver as again, technology in the form of artificial intelligence, machine learning and digital takes a lot of the analytic work that we're doing today and so our economy is beginning to shift. And we explored the idea that service organizations of any shape service organization, whether it's IT service management, technical support, professional services, uh, even sales organizations and pre-sales organizations um, are really positioned to take advantage of this new technology and the intersection of that new technology with our people and our knowledge. So when we think about the feeling economy, the skills that we're going to need people to have are about building relationships, being adaptable, creative problem solving. This is what we've been talking about for years and years in services as the skill sets we need our people have to service people. So service organizations already today have the skills of the next economy. We're talking about massive amounts of data information and all that data and information turning into knowledge. And this has been the currency of support services organizations forever as well. We have been saying for a long time, the case is not a currency. The case is just a tracking number that lets you attach that tracking number to what's going on. 
but really the currency is all the information and knowledge that we have in our support organizations. These two things are intersecting now with new artificial intelligence like generative AI, which seems like it was purpose built for service organizations to capture, restructure, build, all of the things we talk about with our knowledge. And that intersection is really what's going to be powering service organizations moving forward. And we're, we're positioned to take advantage of it. But how do we take advantage of it? How do we think about building those use cases? How do we think about where we start and where we are going to end? It's not about the underlying technology. The underlying technology is always going to advance. It's always going to change. It's the interaction layer that is the experience that we need to drive. And human-centered design is a great roadmap for us or tool for us to think about how do we leverage any technology to drive a customer experience. And in human-centered design, three things that are talked about are the desirability. So are we meeting the people's needs? What are the use cases, the employee uh, experience? Are we co-creating things together with our customers, with our people, with our employees? Is it feasible? So what we want to do, is it feasible to do it? Do we have the technology and the infrastructure to be able to do the things that we want to do? And does it align to our our business? Is it viable? If it doesn't align to our business strategy or it doesn't align to the business and what it's trying to accomplish, then we're just going to hit roadblocks trying to implement new things or do new things. So human-centered design gives us a bit of a roadmap to think about this. Uh, we had some presentations of the 2023 member summit on human-centered design and thinking about that. So this is something that you know we've been using and we can continue to use as a roadmap. And when we overlay the latest iteration on the predictive customer engagement, which is a model we've been playing with for 10 plus years now, when we think about the use cases and the experience layer, the interaction layer, it's about the inputs and outputs to the system. So what is it that I'm giving somebody that I need help with? And what do I get back from that person? Or what do I get back from that machine? What happens behind the curtain, I actually don't care about. I care about the experience of me interacting with something. The feasibility, do we have the AI systems in place and the sources and repositories of information we need to power the AI system to actually be able to deliver on our customer experience? And then do we have a strategic plan? Do we have governance in place? Do we have privacy in place? Do we have the operations in place? Do we have that business viability to support what we're trying to achieve? So this is a, the latest iteration of the predictive customer engagement model as we as a group and as members start to move it away from just being predictive into now much more of a broad, how can we think about implementing and applying these new technologies to deliver the results that we need and what does that interaction layer look like? So this is something we're definitely gonna to continue to play with as we go through the next year. As we start to play with these models, can we use the principles of an adaptive organization to test our ideas? So what would these principles look like for AI? So we're thinking about trust. Are we designing our stuff on a basis of trust? Are we thinking about transparency and security? Are we thinking about the people and the data? And are we doing things in an ethical way that are going to benefit people and benefit us as a society? Are we focusing on value creation, not just activities? Does it align the principles of abundance? Are we implementing these technologies to enhance versus replace? And is it demand driven? So how do we harvest and learn from all the trends and patterns and everything we see from these technologies to continue to drive our systems forward? So I'm very excited to start to play with this with member companies and the community and see how we can start to build out the principles, the core concepts, the techniques and the design ideas for uh, artificial intelligence systems or automation systems. I don't want to say digital automation. That's probably one of the most overused words. Um, but how can we start to actually build these things out and have a framework for people to, to leverage? Moving from some of that baseline work that's going on in the membership, we started to explore 
a actual use case at PTC where they're leveraging generative AI. And then moving from that, this technology is forcing faster adaptations. And so how do we support humans through this change? Knowing that we actually have the tools to support our people. And then a discussion on a very practical way to support your people and improve collaboration within your teams. And doing that helps us through these change initiatives. So it really was a great flow from a little bit of context setting of what's going on to a real world use case that is impacting people at a company to how we're gonna take people through those changes with practical examples and tools that we can use to support people. So PTZ's presentation, um, I found it fascinating. I'd say less from a standpoint of what the actual outcome is that they're building, but more the process that they're following to be thoughtful about implementing these new technologies. Starting with, it takes a team of people, so pulling the right people together, co-creating this with the right people to make sure that the experiences and use cases are the most valid ones for the company. Uh, Roman talked about starting with something that is easy, not because it's not fun to think about all the great hard things that you can do, but if it's easy to prototype and start to show success with, starting there to prove out your concepts instead of something that's gonna require massive corporate support and investment, gives you a little bit of runway to learn, build credibility and start to have an impact without huge investment. Making sure you have a solid plan and are clear on how are we gonna validate ROI can we do that with hard numbers? Is it more of a survey base? Like how do we actually prove out what we're doing? And then how do we deploy it? And then how do we scale it into production? And understanding the benefits and risks of what you're doing. So what are the good things you're gonna get? And what are the things you have to be worried about? Nothing is ever gonna be always perfect. So what are the things that you know are risks? And it's not just a shiny new thing. I mean, it was very clear that they're thinking about what is realistic and how do I do it? and How do I show returns on that? And then what is the next step? So I thought it was a great roadmap that fits very well into what we're talking about in terms of human-centered design. It matched human-centered design incredibly well into a practical application of using generative AI. From that, Kelly from the consortium took us through thinking about how we support humans through the change and that change is not all or nothing. It's not like, yes, we've done the change or no, we haven't done the change. Adaptation is a process that people go through. And we can take people through that process if we focus on culture. Culture helps us navigate the mess of change, the mess of adaptation. And if we feel like we're a part of a community that is supporting us, my fear of change is far less. And it allows us to really think about what it takes to support each other as humans and pull each other together as a team. So this set the stage shifting from look at the cool things we can do with technology to the, there are human impacts and we have to think about those human impacts to Maddie Hoffman really giving us a blueprint. I mean, it, it was a fantastic blueprint for a practical, intentional approach to making sure we have connections with our people. And I loved how she broke it down into thinking about as people, process, and technology. What are the things that we have to worry about with the people? How can we apply processes to that? And then how do we leverage our technologies? And throughout it, you just felt that you have to give yourself as a leader and the people in your teams the time to get to know each other and support each other. And she showed us a template that they have built and she shared out, it's connected through the members wiki, of a way to refresh with your team, not just the things that are going on at work. They do every year do a refresh on what is our vision? What is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish? But also getting to know each other with some slider bars on things like, do I like pancakes or waffles more? So really trying to connect to your teams and your people as people, not just as workers that have a job to get done. 
And a lot of what they're doing is based on the nurturing adaptive workforce, uh, which is again in the members only wiki and is a great resource for, for people to kind of leverage and take a look at. From the main sessions, um, we had a great lunch under the rain in the freezing weather in Fort Worth. So one of the themes that we seem to be developing with Summit is we go to a place where the weather's supposed to be beautiful and then we end up with some rain, but it was kind of nice and cozy and we had heaters under the tent, and so it worked out perfect. But, uh, but after lunch, we went into breakout sessions on day one. So breakout session one and two were with Nicole and Christian from ProAlpha talking about their KCS journey. And then Sarah Thomas Ham from Blizzard Entertainment talking to us uh, about doing more with less uh, innovation in this world full of constraints. The ProAlpha presentation is a fantastic blueprint for how to think about and implement KCS. And shockingly, that blueprint follows the blueprint that's in the practices guide and the adoption guide. So leveraging the experiences of, you know, 30 years of members doing KCS, ProAlpha has applied that to their environment. And I think some of the key takeaways from their discussion is that you really need to be planned out about what you're doing with KCS. You need to invest in it. So you need to think about what is it that we need to do for KCS training? How are we going to approach it? And what works for us? Preparing for disruption. There's always something that gets in the way. They had to take a six month break during their implementation of KCS because of a complete change to their CRM system. And they recognized that we can't be asking our entire teams to follow new processes, follow a new tool for interaction at the same time as trying to implement KCS. So they took a six month break and then continued on their path. They also were very intentional about small waves instead of large waves. So they're not a very large support organization and they had 11 waves. And in each wave, they had a coach go along with that wave. And so they're very intentional about what is it going to take to empower our people to be successful? It's not just, oh, we, we put a process in place, we put the tool in place. Now people aren't doing what we want them to do. Right. They were very intentional about we need to bring people on a journey and had a very strong people focus to their implementation and they're seeing great results. So fantastic discussion by, by Nicole and Christian from, from ProAlpha. The discussion with Blizzard was super interactive. Um, Sarah Thomas Ham gave us a bit of a context setting on some of the challenges that are being faced at Blizzard. But those are challenges that everybody in the room can identify with. We don't have enough resources to do everything we want to do. We're facing a lot of pressure to use AI and ML. We have a growing customer base. We are part of a very, very large acquisition going on. All the things that other companies and other people are facing. And we had a very interactive discussion where she asked everybody in the audience to take five minutes at a time to talk about some challenges around a support model, challenges around machine translation, and challenges around AI and LLM. And during those discussions, lots of ideas, lots of approaches were discussed and captured. So it was a super interactive session, uh, which was, was super fun. I was in that room. And it was great to see everybody heads down, talking at their table, writing things down, really feeling that they are a part of these challenges because they face these challenges as well. So she did a great job of kind of setting the context and then inviting the audience in to participate in, in the sessions. It was almost like a mini open space session where the questions were given to you instead of you coming up with the questions. So it was a super interactive session. And Kelly, do you want to talk about Breakout sessions three and four? I do. Uh, so across the hall, um, we had a, a couple of other sessions happening. Um, the first one was Intelligent Swarming with, uh, presented by Royce at Autodesk. Um, and the second one was this course correcting um, when conversations go off the rails um, 
which was a demo um, by some very talented consortium <laughs> actors. Um, so Royce talked about it. So uh, actually a number of months ago, Royce reached out and said, hey, um, a, as you know, we tried swarming uh, at Autodesk in 2018, and we have a great case study about that. And then some organizational changes happened, and we stopped doing some swarming. And then maybe we tried it again, and then that didn't quite work. But now the third time's the charm, and we have a, a pretty great story to tell. Um, Royce took the Intelligent Swarming Practices Guide and really sort of adopted it by the book. And so, um, interestingly enough, uh, he found that implementing in waves, oh, that sounds so familiar, uh, was very <laughs> helpful in terms of helping people sort of take first small steps, learn from what we're doing, get some internal referenceability, um, uh, and, and then uh, had a great plan for how he was going to enhance that program as he gained um, both adoption and momentum. Um, so they had some great results from this. Um, but but just so very interesting to hear that indeed the the template that the adoption, the KCS adoption and transformation guide lays out uh, is very helpful in terms of managing all kinds of kind of programmatic change. Um, there were some there were some great takeaways from this session in terms of the practices guide, the intelligence warming practices guide that is is very helpful. Um, there start start small, right? Do what you can with the tools that you have before you go shopping. So a lot of the things that we learn from implementing KCS are totally applicable to implementing intelligence warming. Um, and then the other thing he did was get just a ton of feedback uh, from folks who were doing swarming uh, in order to take those next steps and uh, move the program forward. They also found a time that they had to take a break for a little while because of things that were going on internally. Um, and I think sort of going back to the way people understand change or the way people progress through change, just that idea that it's not all or nothing and that you it's okay to pause for a little while if other crazy things are going on. It doesn't mean you have failed or that you have stopped forever or that you can't ever go back and pick it back up. Um, it just means that there's a lot going on and we're gonna take a break for a little bit. So um, we are very much looking forward to continuing that conversation with Royce in terms of um, hearing more and more about what Autodesk is learning from that implementation. And then in the second session um, across the hall, in, uh, let's see, a couple, just a couple months ago, a couple weeks ago, actually, um, we had a team meeting called uh, Building a Culture of Coaching. And at the end of that team meeting, where we, we were really sort of exploring what that phrase meant, um, what would it mean to build a culture of coaching, uh, a whole handful of folks were hanging out. And Jessica said, you know, I think it would be super fun to see an example of a conversation that has gone just completely sideways and then talk about how you might bring that back. And so um, Lana, who's on the call, hi Lana, um, wrangled uh, and moderated this session and talked a little bit about um, the coaching skills that we have in our toolboxes, not only to have those coaching conversations, but also to um, interact with in, in other scenarios. Uh, and Kendall from F5 and Jessica from Calix uh, did a horribly uncomfortable demo uh, in which they had a conversation. Um, they had a conversation that was virtual, right? They were demonstrating this at the front of the room. And by the end of it, every you could see everyone in the room just, oh, it didn't go well. <laughs> it was it was terrible. It, from an emotional standpoint, um, they drove the point home that sometimes conversations go poorly. Um, and then they demonstrated a conversation that involved Kendall's character coming back uh, in person and sort of repairing the relationship using a whole bunch of coaching skills uh, and it was delightful. Um, Lana invited people to reflect on what they had seen, what had gone wrong in the first conversation and what had gone right in the second conversation. And it was a, just a wonderful session to kind of reflect on um, this set of skills that we have, how, how, how things can go sideways and uh, how we can leverage those skills to get, to get back on, on track. So, um, 
Jessica actually set her phone up in this session and recorded it, which I didn't, I was not sure that it would work, but now we have it captured in the wiki. So members can find um, this presentation uh, on the member summit page in the wiki, which is pretty, pretty cool. So thank you so much to Lana and Jessica and Kendall and also Royce. And then after we had our breakout sessions on um, Tuesday, we went back together and spent time with Professor Nick before going off to the art museum. But then Wednesday morning, we woke up and spent all day in open space. Um, this was unlike any open space session I have ever been in, in that I think we figured out that almost half the attendees proposed a topic to um, explore with each other. So we spend, um, on open space morning, we spend about 45 minutes setting up the things that we want to talk about during the day. Um, this, this board originally was set up with four different sessions, four different time slots, and uh, seven spaces for conversation. And after we kind of talked about the process of how we were going to um, propose topics, uh, the the whole staff watched with mouths agape as people wrote down their proposed topics and then lined up around the outside of the room. And it the line was longer than I've ever seen it. So we added an eighth location so that we could have room for 32 topics. And by the time we sort of did all of the combining um, and, and the thinking about how we wanted to spend our day together, we ended up with 30 topics explored. People took excellent notes. Those are captured in the wiki. Um, it, it was a quite an, a, an AI focused day, lots of different kind of ways that people were thinking about and talking about AI in addition to some of the other sort of greatest hits topics that we that we like to that we like to talk about. So we have lots of follow-up discussions planned from um, all of the energy that was that was happening on open space day. Here are some of the notes. I do love this image. Um, FOPA stands for fear of publishing articles. And this was an open space session where people were really talking about how do you define what is sufficient to solve and how do you get people over the hump of, I can't, I'm, not a, I'm not a good writer, I can't possibly publish an article. So um, that was one of our most memorable uh, report outs also. So we end Open Space Day um, with a very brief report out over beer and wine. Uh, each, per, each session uh, offers a sentence or two about what they talked about uh, so that folks know what the other conversations were that happened. Uh, and then uh, maybe just a little bit about if there's follow-up required or not. So. It, yeah, it was a shockingly fun thing to see everybody stand up and not only people stand up but they also got back in line so a lot of That's people said their topic and then got back at the end of the line to go back through because um, there was another topic yeah. that was of interest to them yeah. yeah so so on day three we did tried something new uh which was fun we did four quick 15 minute discussions with different members and then kind of brought brought the uh, all the all the stuff together at the end um, so the the four discussions were designed to be more high level not going deep into a topic but giving a bit of a taste of some of the things people were thinking about and some of the works that are going on around the consortium now we started it with Pat McBride from Oracle talking about KCS and pre-sales at Oracle and I think the big takeaway is that it works. You can do KCS not in support, but you can do KCS pretty much anywhere in any organization, um, as long as you are taking the time to understand what it is that we have in common. So what are the things that we can leverage in KCS, but how do we apply those in these different worlds where you're not living in a CRM system? Pre-sales isn't living in a system that allows them to easily just do everything that we would do in say a support organization. Um, so a great discussion by Pat. There's quite a bit of resources uh, on KCS beyond support. I mean, even in the practices guide, right? We talk about it in ways that is very applicable outside of support. Um, but in the wiki, there are presentations that kind of bring you on the journey that Pat's been on at Oracle in, in doing this, going back to 2022 uh, with optimizing sales support through KCS and then a 
consortium conversation that took place in 2023 with Pat, Ludwig, and Sarah about where they are. <clears throat> so Pat gave us a very brief overview of the more detailed presentations that are available. So it's uh, some, some great resources available. And I'm very excited to see where Pat takes this and hear from him again on this topic as they continue to mature and drive these things through, through different organizations at Oracle. After that, we heard from Jessica and Monica um, at Alation on cultivating KCS buy-in. So both Jessica and Monica have a history with KCS and have been brought into Alation to help them with KCS. Um, and the big takeaway there is it takes time, persistence, and dedication to get KCS implemented. It is a journey. We all know this if any of us have been on that journey. Um, but being clear about what it is you're trying to achieve, getting strong leadership, making sure you're over communicating, which is just communicating. Um, Jessica talked about how at every opportunity, she talks about KCS to the point where she feels like it's repetitive. She feels like she's said this a million times, but until you start hearing other people kind of presenting back to you what you've already presented to them, you maybe haven't communicated enough. So you really can't over communicate. Uh, and then the, this idea of collective ownership, which goes back to even some of the stuff that Roman talked about, the things that Pat talked about. We heard this throughout the event. We need to build things together. We all own this. As a KCS program manager, I don't own KCS. You all own KCS. It is a team sport. We need to co-create it together. That was a big theme that uh, Monica talked about quite a bit in, in her part of the discussion that the two of them had. Then we heard from Travis at JLG. Um, it, the title was Outside the AI Box. JLG is using technologies and machines, obviously, to do some of the, the work they do. But they're a bit, a bit unique where their support and what they're trying to accomplish is supporting somebody who is in a shop trying to fix a piece of equipment, and they need to be responding in minutes and seconds. They can't get back to people three days later because if the machine is not working, somebody is losing money. So it was really about supporting people to get the job done and how do you best do that, but starting with a very human-centric approach and how their knowledge capture is helping them respond faster on very common issues that people see in their equipment. Based on that, they're influencing product. Their knowledge is helping to train people faster. People are supporting each other. And we kind of kidded around because Travis started off saying he's hoping he can come back and present on how they're doing KCS and then spend 15 minutes explaining everything that they're doing, which is 100% sounds like KCS, um, which I think is a an interesting lesson because sometimes even you know when we're having discussions with companies that feel like they're new to KCS, when you talk to them, you're doing KCS. Maybe you're not calling it KCS. Maybe you aren't structuring it or thinking about it exactly the way that the practices guide, but you're capturing information, you're reusing that information, you're improving that information, you're sharing that information, and you're learning from that information, you're pretty much doing KCS. So uh, it was kind of fun fun with Travis in, in hearing about their journey of where they are, and that maybe they're a little long, further along in the KCS journey than they're giving themselves credit for, but they uh, they have a lot of great plans. So it was a great discussion with Travis. And then we ended uh, having a discussion with uh, Andrea Hughes from SAS. And I have already started to change some of my talk track. Even at the beginning of this presentation, I changed some of my talk track based on something that she really talked about in the 15 minutes, which is thinking about things not as change because change kind of implies that you have a starting point and an end point. What we're actually doing is always adapting to the numerous variables that we face, whether those variables are organization changes, technology changes, economic impacts, whatever they are, we're always adapting. And really what we're talking about is how do we get better at being adaptive? How do we continue to adapt to these impacts, it's less about changing, it's more about the adaptation that we go through. A very powerful discussion and um, some of her thoughts on what they're facing at SAS and the way that they're adapting to 
pretty big changes within their company. So it was uh, really, a, I thought, a language change that will benefit all of us if we think about things slightly different. The context is probably the same, but the language can have a big impact. And I think this is the this is language that had a big impact on me and how I think about some of the things that we're talking about. So it was a great discussion with Andrea and big thank you to all four of the last day presenters who kind of made us think a little bit differently and shared their stories with us. Uh, Sarah took us through our kind of collective experiences in action and did a really fantastic job of reminding everybody in the audience that it is all of you, the members, the community that are making it all work and that the shared experiences that we've had and that we've been capturing are what is sparking all of the things that we're gonna work on in the next year. And when you look at all of the work that you did, all of the things that we've captured, all of the things that we've published, it is making me feel like I should go back to the Caribbean for a month instead of a week to take a break. Um, but Sarah did a great job of kind of bringing this context into light of we are capturing and sharing all these experiences, which are sparking new ideas, driving new innovations, helping people that are just starting their journey, think about the journey maybe differently than they did. So it was a, a really fantastic eye-opening way to kind of bring all these things together to realize it's all of you doing all these amazing things that are helping all of these other people. And when we think about the impact that we're having, we are touching millions of people a day. When you think about all of the knowledge that is being shared, all of the websites people are touching, all of the technologies they're interacting with that the members are leveraging and driving and building and the impact it's having in the world is, is kind of mind boggling when you start to think about the scale of what people are doing. And we need to keep those discussions going. This is what is fun about the consortium and the community. Um, so check the events calendar frequently. It is getting updated all the time with new things that are gonna be presented, both member only activities as well as uh, public events. So these are some of the ones that are coming up, but check the calendar, read the newsletter. We're always updating these things and there's always gonna be new opportunities for people to interact and keep all these discussions going. And mark your calendars for 2025. So we'll be in Atlanta, Georgia at the Thompson Hotel, March 25th through 27th, 2025. Um, not sure we can organize a solar eclipse to occur during the event, but you know we'll see what we can organize, see if there's something else that we can come up with. But um, you know, we look forward to seeing everybody in, over the next year at all of the different events, through all the discussions, in the member Slack workspace, on the phone, through email, all the ways that we interact. We're, we're really excited and looking forward to what the next year is going to bring and then discussing a lot of those things at the Thompson Hotel in Atlanta. And thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to everybody who made Member Summit so memorable and amazing. Not just the people that presented, but everybody who attended, all of the new faces that we got to meet. It was uh, really a pleasure to get to host everybody for a few days. <laughs>